those lazy strategies, I would say, that would work really well during COVID of just going in, throwing an offer and just hoping the best and it's going to sell the next day in the market for 50,000 more than you want it. It's not going to work, right? So you have to be more innovative in your approach on both sides, acquisition and disposition, and then you will be successful. And then obviously once the market turns, you'll be five steps ahead of everyone and then you will capture a huge market share. Max, thank you for joining me on our Thought Leader Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Matt Camp, here at Head of Partnerships over at Deal Machine. And on these, we really like to shine a spotlight on industry experts like yourself, you know, hear your inspiring stories and really hear how you see the world evolving. So I'm um, really excited to welcome on today, Max Vollmer. Uh, Max is a world-class tra track and field athlete competing for Germany. Um, and then on the real estate side, you own 50 plus rentals, 120 plus apartment doors, uh, you've done four, over 400 fix and flips and wholesales. Um, and then you also put out content on social media and also launched a coaching business on uh, volmercoaching.com. So you've got quite a few things going on. Appreciate you taking a few minutes out with us today, Max. Appreciate it, man. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Can, can you tell us more? I mean, I, I read a little bit about your bio, a little bit about your journey there, but um, can you maybe tell us more? I know you started with uh, $76 in your bank account. And you've turned that into, you know, a real estate empire effectively. So um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about that journey and especially the early days, the lessons that you learned um, so our audience can can hear about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It was, a, it was a, a, how would I say, it was an up and down, like a roller coaster ride, right? Um, when we initially started, we had absolutely no experience about real estate at all. Um, we haven't done anything, you know, coming from a family you know, that has been in real estate. My parents clearly don't know much about real estate um they've done you know no investments nothing so we had no background we had no connection to people in that space either but i guess the reason how we started the reason how this all basically turned out to be what it is today is when i initially came over into the united states i came as a f1 student visa athlete so basically i was born in germany but i came over got a scholarship which was amazing but the problem was that i could not work legally with that visa you can only go to school you can only be a student but you cannot work. Even if you like try to go to a gas station, you know, just do something, but you cannot do it. It's absolutely ridiculous. It makes no sense, right? Because you still have expenses. So when COVID then hit, um, there was no sports, there was no money coming in, but expenses obviously stayed the same. You still got to pay for rent and food. So you're running out of money. And the only way for us to actually have any kind of income was starting our own business, right? So like that visa doesn't really require me to well, I guess it doesn't limit me to do my own stuff, right? Because I was married to my wife already. So we, we were running a business. There was no problem with that, but we had no choice. And at that point, when we started, like you said, with $76 on the bank, January 7th, 2020, and there isn't really much you can do, even if you get a $12 an hour job, you're not going to get enough money to pay rent and you to pay for food. So it was a tricky situation. And we were really pushed to the wall at that point in time. And so I was just sitting there. I was like, okay, we got to figure something out, right? We're not going to get far with what we have right now. So we have nothing to lose pretty much. And I guess that was being pushed to the wall, almost forced us to get out of our comfort zone and figure something out, right? And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm glad that it's happened. And most people usually discover great success by being just pushed to the wall, having no plan B, right? If you don't give yourself a plan B, you usually have to succeed because there's no other choice. You just got to commit to it and work harder and harder and harder and never give up. And eventually you will be successful. So that's kind of like how it started. And um, when we initially started, the market was, you know, a favor, right? It was a huge wholesale market. Prices were going up almost every single day. It was just absolutely nuts. But it allowed us to enter that space quickly and, you know, build or rebuild in such a short amount of time because you could go in and just wholesale. So we basically had no risk. Uh, we didn't need to spend a lot of money and then building a business. And we were basically learning while we were doing it, while we started to learn a lot of things while doing the first couple of deals. There's a lot of things we did wrong, uh, but eventually you learn it. You talk to people in this space, you get better, you get better contracts. Um, mm -hmm. You get lucky with some deals, you get unlucky with others, but we had no idea. And so we kind of like really focused on first, first of all, investing in us, right? Educating us as much as we could, and then focusing on networking to people in that space, which was mainly important at the beginning to just open a mindset, right? It, what is possible? What are the opportunities out there? And we had a, and we started, we never knew about multifamily syndication, buying rentals, refinance, all these things. We had no idea, right? So like opening that perspective to what is actually possible and talking to people in that space was huge because our family, 
um, first of all, they didn't believe in us. And we started, hey, we're going to do our own business. They basically told us, go back to school, you know, focus on it. You're just going to waste time, money, and resources. Um, so there wasn't really much support. And being in a community and you know, surrounding yourself with people that have that same mindset, but it's really all we needed. It's like, hey, those guys can do it. And they're just like us. They're not any gifted, they're not, you know, on a cloud. They're not anything different. They have the same struggles. They eat, they live, they sleep. Um, we can do that too. In fact, you know, we are younger, we can probably accomplish more by the time we get to their ages, right? So it was this mindset shift of like, hey, this is possible. And I think anything starts with mindset, right? Once you start believing in yourself and you believe in a vision that you have that you're going to accomplish it, that's the most important step. You can learn everything that is out there. You can go through all the coaching classes in the world. If you don't believe in yourself and you don't believe that it's possible and you don't have the foundation, just the mindset, you're never going to be successful, right? So then... The first thing for us was just like changing that mindset, opening up that opportunity, accepting this as possible, visualizing that success and, and being able to, you know, manifest something that wasn't real, right? It was not really not successful at that point in time, but we visualized it, you know, a path to get there. And then obviously you have to put the work in, um, educate yourself and, and do the right things at the right time to get to actually be successful and put that vision to, to point. But yeah, we started with, with wholesaling real estate, initially wholesaling vacant land um, because the market was, there was a shortage in the housing market. So we realized that when we, when we entered, we talked to a lot of real estate agents and everyone was like, you know, the major problem right now is I don't have enough inventory. Everyone wants to buy. I don't have enough stuff. Everything is selling so quickly. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are moving out of these suburban areas are moving out of the cities into these suburban areas. Sorry. And obviously there wasn't that inventory, but it was a bunch of vacant lands. So what we started to do is we figured those, you know, suburban areas we figured out where are people migrating where are people moving and then we started contacting vacant land parcels versus homes and just figured out hey can we can we buy this property for you and wholesale it the same strategy than you know wholesaling houses you just contacting a different kind of clients we flipped a bunch of vacant land and then eventually out of that you know scaled into houses scaled into new developments scaled into fix and flips scaled into syndications so all just like builds up on top of each other but we started with literally just dirt making third. <laughs> wow, man, that's inspiring. And that's a lot to dig into too. And that's, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear it. I, I mean, I know, I know you had that athletic background as well. Like you were, you know, in, in the track and field world. Um, it sounds like you, you, a lot of your mindset from that and, and, you know, the things that you went through and pushed yourself there really applied to real estate. Like, would you say that your, your athletic career and how would you say your athletic career prepared you for, for taking this jump into real estate? Yeah, I think it, it was the, the key source of everything we've accomplished. And obviously I'm doing it a bit with Caitlin, my wife, right? And she mm -hmm. has been doing sports on a different level. She was never on like the world class level, but she was also in college. So she had a little bit of it, but I, I was always consistently teaching her because, you know, in, in world class sports, all the secrets, if you say so, are already, um, you know, common. Everyone is using it. If you're a world class athlete, ne nobody is like, oh, this is new. I've never heard that. My right? visualization, commitment, the hard work, you know, that you're getting better from failure you know that you have to push yourself you know that when it hurts it's the moment when you have to push harder because you know you're getting better right these these simple things as an athlete you're naturally driven and you're naturally in a in a space that well you know this is what is needed and this is like the standard and then you go back to like the business world and a lot of people don't accept it they just don't understand you know some of the foundations of just how important mindset is the belief in yourself right all these things are huge in sports and I guess the, the importance also in sports is you see it right away, right? If you are attempting a bar and a high jump or anything that you do or you're lifting weights and you're attempting like personal records or close to it, you see how quickly like mindset will change your performance. Like you see the, the impact of like internal emotions and mind mindset quickly. You see, okay, I can actually do better, right? So you get, it's like a playground where you can play with different mindsets and instantly see the results, right? But in, in, in real life, you could say so in business, it's not like that, right? You're not going to think about, oh, I'm going to be successful today or, you know, change this strategy tomorrow. You're going to get a deal and you're going to all of a sudden win everything, right? So it's, it's mm -hmm. more a steady process where you have to continuously push yourself to, to stay consistent with your mindset and stay consistent to your commitment to then eventually get to that point. It's a lot slower than in sports, right? In sports, you can change certain emotions, be more confident and all of a sudden you, you perform well, right? Because you changed something. Um, and it triggers it. But so for me, it was like a playground. I experienced, you know, other things in sports and I used it and I knew it's going to work because I've experienced it while doing sports and it was really helpful. And um, it was almost unconscious because from years and years and years of doing it, even in a young age, right? I learned these things without 
necessarily knowing that I had it in me, right? I mean, I started reading into those books of successful entrepreneurs. I was like, yeah, all this is common sense. I'm doing this every single day. So I realized this is just the key. So I started connecting that. And um, that was the game changer. I think that was the reason why we have been so successful so quickly, because at the end of the day, it's all just in a way energy, right? So once you start thinking, you're connecting with the right people around yourself because you're just changing your emotional state, right? You could, you're thinking mm -hmm. about, this is how I'm going to be successful. This is how it's going to feel. And you're always, you're always positive, you know, thinking about negative things. So you're trying to at least. So ultimately your brain is consistently like attractive to those kind of emotional states and you're attracting, you know, people around you, you're attracting opportunities. You're just more open to receive what you're visualizing if you're in that space and you're consistently doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And it sounds so simple, but it is also so true, right? And we, we have learned this multiple times and every time when we have bad times, we reflect back and be like, oh shit, you know, the last couple of months, we just haven't really found that mental path. We haven't visualized our goals. We haven't slacking like the basics. And then we go back to it and, you know, things are slowly yeah, getting back to where it's supposed to be. So I think everyone who has accomplished anything in sports and in business would always agree that it's, you know, you can learn anything you want, but if you don't use your mindset and your emotions the right way, you're never really going to, to accomplish what you really want to accomplish and what is really your true future self. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. And, and uh, you know, I know a couple of times you've mentioned Caitlin here. Um, so your, your wife, I know you've teamed up with in the real estate mm -hmm. business as well. Uh, can you maybe talk about, I mean, how, how you all team up, you know, how you um, split up duties and really are a great team together. And then if you have any tips for uh, people who are looking to, to build a business with their significant other, like any, any advice for them uh, would be great too. Yeah. So it's definitely, a blessing in a course, I would say, right? as, as both sides, right? The one thing is for us, I've seen relationships, you know, break because people do business together and I've seen relationship drive because they do business together. So we had no idea what to expect when we started, but we also had no choice. And personally, I think it was the best for us because the way we are, it just works naturally. But sometimes you're married to somebody who's the complete opposite and it might not work. Um, what works for us is obviously like we're supporting each other and we're really like on the same level. So we see those times where, you know, I kind of struggle mentally because, you know, stuff is just moving. I'm getting really stressed out of, you know, weeks and weeks of bad news or whatever. And then sometimes I get drifted away and then she's like almost an accountability partner taking me back. Right. And it's vice versa. Like it always works out that we realize, Hey, the other person is kind of drifting away. Just bring them back to the path. Everything is going to be fine. It's focused, but right? it helps a lot, but it's also just giving each other, that space to do, to discover things they want to do, um, to make their own experience, their own networks and just trusting each other, right? That's like really the most important thing about doing that business. And then the even more important than that is that you separate it, right? You don't bring business in into your personal life so much. Like you're almost treating it in a way, you have a separate room in the house where you work and we work in that room. But once we get out of it, we try to be away from work, right? We try to just talk about personal things, have date nights, and not just, you know, bring it to the dinner table and bring it to bed and talk about deals all day because then, you know, it's fine for a couple of weeks, but over months, you will see quickly that you guys just get too tied up into your work. And then mm -hmm. once bad things happen at work, it's impacting emotionally and then it's also impacting your relationship. So if you keep those things separate, then you always have something to fall back because there's going to be bad days with real estate on any business you do at the beginning. So as long as you have something to fall back to, and you're not letting that stress and these negative emotions impact your relationship, then you will be successful. But there's obviously that balance. So you have to realize what you're doing. You have to realize how it's impacting you. And you have to always be cautious about the things you do. And, you know, give yourself that time out. It's so important. At the beginning, I guess we also like overworked. We just tried, we thought, you know, more is more like working more, working longer is going to get us there quicker. But eventually yes there's times where you have to work more but then if you do it in a long scale for months you're just going to burn out and your performance is actually going to be less productive and you're just going to take more stress into your personal life so like getting a gap of like taking a clear break and just not thinking about it at all doing something entirely different for me that's like when i go to train or when i go and, and compete i don't have my phone or when i work out so that's like my space where i usually get my recovery and then i'm, I'm ready to go again but for other people that don't have that necessarily or their own relationships they have to find that space where you just get out and you just don't talk about business you don't even think about it it's just being here now and enjoy the other things that you do 
I yeah. don't have that business control. You control your business and then you'll be successful. Don't have it control you. <laughs> that, yeah. It will kill you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's really good advice, man. And, um, you know, pre appreciate you sharing that because I, I know a lot of people in our audience, they, you know, might be new getting into real estate, just going down this path, possibly with a significant other. So um, having this, you know, laid out and, and you having been through it for a while, like, you know, gives people a, a good thing to aim for. So um appreciate that I, I one thing you, you mentioned earlier as well you talked about you know virtually you built this wholesaling business I, I know you guys I believe have it in eight different states going um can you maybe talk through just strategies and processes on how really just the playbook on how you build a virtual business like that and how you're able to get that off the ground and and maybe talk about that for somebody looking to try to build a virtual business um in general in that in that way um I know you you hit it on it a little bit but um would love to hear a little bit more from me on like hey here's uh you know some of the key tenants of that that made it successful there yeah, absolutely. I think wholesaling is probably the easiest strategy to get started, right? Because it doesn't require much capital and you don't have the risk because you're just assigning contracts. Mm -hmm. um, it's the easiest way to get started. And yes, when we first started, because we did vacant land, you know, at some point you're running out of inventory in your markets, so you have to switch. Um, so we did it in eight different states, which is easy because if you're looking at vacant land itself, there's nothing to inspect, right? You don't have tenants, toilets, permits, it's just vacant parcels. You look at the zoning, you see if there's a wet lane, you see if there's utilities to it, and it's all you need to see. So you can do all that research from Google Maps. So obviously made it really easy going in a different stage, which is flipping around counties, right? If you're doing wholesaling um, of homes in different markets, which we've also, we've also done it remote in different states, that adds a little bit of complexity. Um, usually what you need is you need somebody local to at least inspect it or have some kind of local force, um, which is easy to find too. You find other real estate agents, Maybe somebody who's new getting started, somebody who's excited, you tell them like, hey, let's partner up, we'll bring you a bunch of deals, you can inspect them, you get a commission. Right? Any smart real estate agent that is, is new or doesn't have a huge list of people working with, they'll be happy to work with you guys. So building those relationships, like real estate is always about relationships. It's relationships first before profits and numbers and anything, right? So mm -hmm. if you're going out of state where you cannot inspect it or you don't have the people there, you need to find a good closing company that understands to work with investors, right? That's huge. Um, and then you need to find at least like a real estate agent who can go out there, inspect the property, maybe take some pictures. But more importantly, if you're obviously flipping it, there's going to be sellers who want to see the property. So somebody who's local facilitating that meetup, you know, when you sell it, all of a sudden talk to the homeowner and then they cut you out, right? Because those things happen and you cannot avoid it. So having at least one relationship, somebody local that can be at those meetups, they get a chunk of the money for, you know, spending their time, but also helping you close these deals is important. And then you can do a lot of the, you know, research virtually once you have pictures, um, you will probably pretty much see a lot of the things here. Yeah, there might be some slip throughs, but if you host it, you're not going to have much risk, but you're not fixing it up actually. So you can also use the first couple of people that are looking at those properties and they're inspecting them. You can use their inspection report when they report back to you if you've done anything wrong and readjust the offers, readjust the wholesale prices, right? So you can really play around and, and you know, finding the ARV, having access to the MLS. If you have a realtor out there, having access to the MLS for better comps. So it's, it's really just like building um, a system within that state, mm -hmm. wherever you're operating, right? You need to have at least some, some vendors locally. And then if you're running a virtual business, like we've done it in the past with virtual assistants, right? That's fairly simple. You're finding VAs, you're training them, you're building your processes and you're consistently just making sure that these people do their, their work and are efficient and, you know, are happy, but you can also do it uh, you know, a virtual setting with people in the United States that are just working from anywhere, they can just do the same things. It doesn't really change much or going this route of like utilizing other wholesalers, utilizing other real estate agents to bring you deals. And you're basically just facilitating the disposition side. That's another thing that works, right? Because if you do active acquisition, you have to spend the money on marketing to find deals. And if you do more the passive one where you go more the disposition route, you're more finding a network to bring your deals and you help them sell those, right? So building a really strong buyers list is another strategy of getting into real estate, but even less money. You just have to find the guys that buy, find how, how to find them, and then just have people bring you the deals and have them negotiate, have them inspect it, right? So it goes both ways. And I think that's going to be um, still easy to do. The only thing that's going to be changing is the market is changing, right? So those typical cash offer wholesale deals are going to be, more complicated so you have to almost adjust with that recession to more 
innovative strategies like on the acquisition side or also the disposition side innovation is going to be one where you basically hotel it to the mls to end buyers gives you a different range of people that you can attract it to and then seller financing anything creative is going to be probably a massive massive opportunity in the next couple of months because of the interest rates so if you're really getting used to those more complicated strategies in a say you can still do the wholesales. You can still get a contract and sell it, probably, but you get a contract of I'm taking over the existing mortgage and I finance out the equity at 4% with a five-year balloon, but you're just making it creative and have a buyer buy it from you, the contract, just like a typical cash. But now it makes it more attractive for them because they can cash flow those deals, right? Because if somebody buys it now, they can cash flow them if they buy it at retail value. You have to buy with huge discounts and most owners don't want to get those discounts because they still have equity. They still got to move on, got to find a different house. So if you can find a solution now, how can I give them the most, but still find a solution for the end buyer to have a profitable property where they can cash flow and actually build a rental portfolio, then you'll be really successful, right? So those, those lazy strategies, I would say, that worked really well during COVID of just going in, throwing an offer and just hoping the best and it's going to sell the next day in the market for 50,000 more than you want it. It's not going to work, right? So you have to be more innovative in your approach on both sides, acquisition and disposition, and then you will be successful. And then obviously, once the market turns, you'll be five steps ahead of everyone, and then you will capture a huge market share. Love it, man. Yeah, that, I was going to ask. Uh, you know, I, I know you said you 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 know started in a in a wholesale rich environment. And you were really doing that straightforward wholesaling. I, I was going to ask if you're changing your strategy personally at all. You know, through this downturn, and and you know, I, I know you said creative finance, innovations. Those are all things to be thinking about. Um, you know, anything else there in terms of tips for especially for the newbie and uh, you know trying to trying to get into this for the first time in terms of how to adjust with this market. Yeah, I think those are the two things you need to do to adjust, right? Once you understand, so if you go in direct to sell, you need to understand how can you take it down as an ovation deal, which is like a wholesale transaction. You're just wholesaling it on the MLS, meaning you don't have to sell it to cash buyers. You can find actual end retail buyers, right? It's those are the people that are going to pay the most. Um, depending on what deals you get, you got to figure out some more construction to maybe get the property back to retail values for them to get the loan, right? You got to still find, again, a way to to do to, to, for problem solving, right? It's all about problem solving. But ultimately, I think self-financing is going to be um, the biggest play, right? Because um, Eric Burns, which is one of the major economists out there, he uh, predicted, or he didn't predict, but he announced that there's $29 trillion in homeowner equity. So that takes out all investors. It's just individual homeowners, so $29 trillion in equity. And 90% of that is secured at less than 4% interest rates, right? So if you think about that, there's 4% interest rates at $29 trillion of equity. And there's going to be some people out of that $29 trillion of equity that have to sell. You know, they move their jobs. They might lose their jobs. There's a recession environment. There's going to be people pushed to sell, panic sell. And let's say you bought a house a year ago at full retail. And now you're selling it a year later. Or you're going to lose money because you basically like your property has lost value. So you're never going to get equity out. And if you're selling it, you might have to pay the bank, you know, to them get out of the house. Who wants to do that? Nobody, right? So you're not competing against anyone anymore at this point in time because nobody's going to make an offer they can accept. So if you come in and be creative and tell them like, hey, listen, I can give you what you want. I can even give you more. If I get my time that I need and I get the terms that I need, we can be, work something out and we can help you, you know, we can take you over the existing mortgage. I can help you get this mortgage taken off your record so you can apply for a new house. There's so many ways, right? And those strategies are always attractive in a recession, right? This has been around, so financing has been around way before you and I have even born, but it's always in a recession when that's getting huge, right? Everyone is doing it for four or five years and then it stops because the wholesale gets really you know, creative and attractive. So we're still early to it. I don't think it's the perfect market yet. A lot of people are still believing, you know, oh, 30 days later, they will sell it. But eventually give it like a month or two, they will realize that stuff has changed. Um, especially sellers will realize that. And realtors will see, shit, my stuff is sitting for now four months. I'm not selling it. What am I supposed to do, right? And then if you're the only one who's actually making a feasible offer and you're explaining the, the terms and how it works, then you have a huge leverage, right? And it means for you, Yes, you can still wholesale them. But on the other side, if you're really smart, you can acquire deals creatively and just build out your portfolio, meaning you build more passive income and wealth over time, which sets you up to be financially free in the long run, right? There's one way of just getting quick cash now, which is fun. But I think um, if I would change something, I would probably would have kept more of my deals than always selling them. 
because mm-hmm. yeah you make ten thousand dollars but then you know the wholesale or the, the guy who's buying it from you is making fifty thousand or they're keeping it as a rental and they're making like a thousand dollars a month right and you're just getting ten thousand dollars up front at the mm-hmm. beginning sure you need that but now looking back back at those um deals you've done i would have kept more and just spend less in marketing and just like slowly build it like some kind of stable portfolio you know paying me five to ten thousand dollars a month that would have been more attractive now right because now like the cash flow pretty much um is king right cash itself is, is nothing if you don't have cash flow you need to have cash flow and use your cash somewhere and now we have to obviously acquire more of these rentals but anyone getting started um there's always that long-term vision like i'm gonna flip some stuff now and eventually i'm gonna hold some rentals right i think the next 18 months is going to be the perfect time prices are going to decline motivation is going to be through the roof and if you understand how to acquire them creatively you can really pick up a bunch of rentals with, you know, so sometimes even zero money down. It just depends on the circumstances and how you structure those deals. And it allows you to lock them up at amazing rates and really cash flow them and have a hedge to inflation. Um, so that's definitely the, the strategy for us too. We are doing a lot less wholesales, a lot less fix and flips. We've pretty much stopped it entirely, I would say. We still do a couple here and there, but we're, we're really moving into just acquiring rentals, doing creative deals. Um, converting all rentals into short-term rentals, which, you know, a Florida market, here works well. It's a, it's a huge short-term market. And just focusing on, for us, I guess, multifamily because it's a hedge against inflation again. But those assets, yes, they don't pay you like those quick $100,000 assignment fees today. But if you're building your expenses around it in the long run, give it three, four, five years, we will be a lot better off, you know, doing that now than then, right? So that's kind of where we are, just rechanging that, oh, I got to have, you know, the $100,000 today versus I just want to have a million dollars in five years, kind of that strategy. I want to have more in, in the long run. And that, that is really what we do. Love it, Max. Yeah, appreciate it, man. And that doesn't get you fired up to learn about uh, creative finance and, and you know, long, long-term yeah. thing, man. Nothing <laughs> well. So I uh, appreciate you coming on today, man. This has been awesome. Um, how can people connect with you too? Is it uh, social media or what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, social media, we have um, a combined account between me and Katie. So we basically mm-hmm. both do videos, you know, sharing both perspectives of a female in real estate and, and me. It's not just, you know, not a guy in real estate. We try to show both sides and also show um, the, the together piece, like doing it together. Um, so we have Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, everything. It's just Katie dash max dash or underscore, I guess, Katie underscore max underscore Volmer, V-O-L-L-M-E-R. Um, we try to post at least once a day, twice a day. Um, some content, some basically just follow the journey, the things that we learn, the things that we are adjusting. And then obviously um, our coaching is running out where we also do some some free uh, free webinars of you know innovation, seller financing, creative options, getting your mindset straight. Those things are definitely important um, in a economy like right now. And we've realized this, we're going to give that back to people to take advantage of it um, and be financially free in the long run. So that is really simple. That's just volmacoaching.com. Uh, so our last name v-o-l-l-m-e-r coaching.com and then obviously if anyone has you know more specific questions or even has a deal in florida or a multifamily or anything they want to join when you're on um, i'm always happy to do the deals together with people in our network um we've gotten a lot of deals there so they can also just text me directly at my phone number which is a 541 um 526 3369 and perfect just text me say hey i started podcast um i'm interested i have a deal i'm interested in you know learning more whatever it is so 541-526-3369 that is my phone number so i'm always happy to to help because you know when i started i had people help me and i think now it's almost like a duty of giving it back right you gotta give back to people to help other people and that is probably it's a lot more fulfilling seeing other people succeed than just you right if you can share it with other people and they can share with other people too. And then, you know, you have this ripple effect. Um, that's like our mission of just giving back because we've gotten so much from people in our network that we can never repay because those guys, you know, seem to have everything. And now it's, I guess, our duty to just give people the chance to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Perfect. Absolutely, man. And so I really appreciate you being such a good uh, resource for our entire community. I'll, I'll make sure to link to all that as well within the description here too. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, again, we'll also link to our scaling up your real estate business ebook in the description and a few free resources there as well. But um, thanks so much again, Max. Really enjoyed the conversation. Of course. Thank you so much yeah. for having me.
Perfect. And everyone watching uh, is Matt Campbell Deal Machine and happy deal finding.